Seth Klarman is here. He is the legendary investor behind the Boston-based hedge fund, the Baupost Group. It is one of the world's most admired money managers and money, money market managing firms, I should say. Seth has taken on a project for the ages. Klarman is the editor of the seventh edition of Benjamin Graham and David Dodd's landmark investing Bible called Security Analysis. The seventh edition is out today. And Seth Klarman joins us right now in a Squawk Box exclusive interview. And Seth, first of all, welcome. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. You are um, somebody who shies away from publicity. I've been trying to get you to come on the show for years. So has Andrew. So we are thrilled to have you here today. Um, let's talk about the book that brought you here. Great. This book was first published back in 1934. Um, bad time for investing for a lot of people as you headed into what was the depths of the recession of the Great Depression. A lot has changed since that time. And I guess the first question is why? What, what brought you to come in and revise this and bring this version up to date? What made you do this? Yeah. So first of all, it was um, McGraw-Hill called. That's incredibly flattering. Um, I'd had a good experience working on the sixth edition where I was co-editor. And um, a lot had changed in the last 15 years. And I felt strongly that there were things that needed to be talked about. Um, and finally, I thought I could pull together a great team. What you did, and there's some pretty impressive contributions that came in. You've got Roger Lowenstein, Todd Combs, James Grant, um, a lot of people who did this. But what changed so drastically that you felt needed to be adjust, ad addressed over the last 15 years? Yeah. The first thing is we've been in an everything bubble, I think, that um, a lot of money has flowed into virtually everything. Um, historically low interest rates, even zero rates have um, precipitated that bubble. Um, you've also had a lot of changes in the business world. Technology has um, accelerated, if anything, and you've seen disruption of all kinds of businesses, which creates challenges and opportunities for investors. Um, so that's another thing. Um, some asset classes have become increasingly popular. Private credit has um, had, a, had a day in the sun. You've had um, uh, speculation during that bubble in all kinds of things, from crypto to meme stocks to SPACs, in, in a way that I think, and the book has some important reminders for people about the, the dangers of speculation and the importance of remembering what kind of environment you're in. When, when uh, Graham and Dodd first wrote this book, you were talking about a nation where the economy was really dominated by factories and railroads. You talk about things like SPACs, like cryptocurrency. It seems like a pretty different world. What, what is the common thread um, that kind of ties all of this together and how you look at the markets. One of the things I really admire about Graham and, and Dodd writing almost 90 years ago is they, they knew they were in an unusual environment being in, enmeshed in the Great Depression, and yet they tried to write something for the ages. They said, we know this won't be the permanent condition, but we don't know what conditions we will experience. So I think every investor has that challenge that you have to look at the moment you're in and say, which part of this is real, which part of this may be enduring, and which part of this may look completely different as soon as tomorrow, and how do I position myself maintaining somewhat of a longer-term perspective, because I think trying to trade day-to-day -day is not a game anybody really is well-equipped to win. You're, you're a value investor. What does that mean, and what did you learn from Graham and Dodd? The, academic definition of value is by the stock that's cheapest by the numbers. But I don't think that's what Graham and Dodd wanted. In fact, it's clear that they were talking about earnings power and the growth possibilities in a business, even if they're hard to determine. And so I think value has to be determined for every company. The way I think about the market is not that there are growth stocks and value stocks, but rather that all stocks may hold value. Um, but that all stocks also could potentially be overvalued. So you have to have a mechanism, a rubric for figuring out the value of different kinds of assets, different kinds of businesses, and then figure out which ones are trading particularly mispriced. I always thought of, or I used to think of value investors as being people who would steer away from growth stocks, that that was a dangerous spot that would be hard to kind of figure out. That was pretty interesting that one of your big positions you've taken is in Coinbase. How do you figure out what the forward earnings are for that? How do you, especially when you start thinking about things that are hard to value, how do you get into that? How do you look at that and say, okay, this is a place that I definitely see value? Yeah. So I think 
in a world that's changing as fast as this one, it's really important to think about not just what are the earnings today. The earnings today may not be here tomorrow. They may be disrupted. The business may be gone, or they may be 50 or 100 percent more. So I think investors need to take into account what are the longer term prospects for a business. I think investors have become vastly more sophisticated these days than in Graham and Dodd's era in terms of thinking about what causes a business to be resilient to competitive threats. Also, Warren Buffett has showed all of us the value of growth, that he um, thinks hard about some of the highest quality businesses in the world, but only buys them when they're at attractive prices. So I think that's an important element of it as well. What's gotten more complicated with the markets in the 40 plus years that you've been doing this? And by the way, I should say, when I asked Warren Buffett at one point, like people who could beat the market, because he's long talked about indexing, has always thought that indexing is the way to go. He's, there's probably about five people who could actually beat the markets over time. And you're one of the names that he, that he listed on that, um, which is huge praise um, from one of the best investors ever. But what's changed for you over time as the markets have gotten more complicated, as there's been more competition? How, how has your style evolved? I think you have to almost run harder to stay in place, that you have more competitors, smarter competitors, more information is available at everybody's fingertips. Investors need edge to be successful. They need to think about what is it they know or how are they structured that will allow them to outperform, to create alpha for their clients in a way that, that buying the average stock won't do. And so we've become a little bit more focused on private investments. We think there's more inefficiencies in some private markets than public markets. We've become more global over time. When we started, we were a couple of people and $27 million, and today we're, we're almost you know, like $25, $26 billion. So it's really been an evolution in 260 people. Um, I think that you can continue to find edge, though, um, in how you structure yourself, how you incentivize your team, how you lead your team. Um, you can find opportunities in, around the edges of what other people are doing, finding situations that other people are throwing out, like the baby with the bathwater. And they exist. It's, you have to be patient. They're not always there. But when they're there, they can be particularly attractive because the markets can become quite frenetic these days.